Yes, we spend a lot of time, uh, certainly in my field as a demographer, we spend an enormous amount of time talking about the potential economic benefits of health and development. And of course, we like to believe there are political benefits, right, that everything will be better socially, politically, societies will be changed. That was the premise of things like the Millennium Development Goals. But we really don't know that much about any of this. There's really not a body of evidence on this. So the premise of my talk is, is really based on some of my own research, starting to think through what are the causal mechanisms and what is the body of evidence and what data could we start to collect that would actually demonstrate how do improvements in health and development get us to a process of political change, especially if we believe that health is supposed to lead to economic growth and then we find out that it's not, will people rise up and say, okay, if health is going to create growth, give us the lives we need, we need a new government, let's go do it. So, revolution starts right here with Mohamed Bouazizi, sorry for the shocking image, the fruit vendor from Sidi Bouzid, the provincial town in Tunisia, who set himself on fire to protest his ability to earn a living wage, his humiliation at the hands of the local police. So the Arab Spring protest that swept the Arab world, of course, but also the planet, and brought inspiration to literally billions of people, started here, the incredible crowds that, that again, when we think about these crowds or we think about the desperation that brought Bouazizi to that horrible end, we think of desperation, right? Too many people, too many young people, not enough jobs, not enough food. And all of those things play a role in many people's lives. But the fact is, there are places on Earth that since 2008, since the recession, have faced far worse deprivation, far worse hunger than the Arab world. Why did the revolution happen in the Arab world? And I argue that that brings us back to the theme of this TEDx change event. What are the returns to health and development? And that one of the big returns is that health and development will lay the groundwork for serious revolutionary change. So b I begin this story with a bit of a thought experiment. So compare the despots. Kim Jong-il and Muammar Gaddafi, two despots who left this planet in the past year, share a number of things in common, right? Big hair, uh, eclectic fashion sense. I love the uh, African le historic leaders shirt we have there. And of course, a predilection for nuclear weapons. So it's an easy comparison to make on the surface, yet there are some big differences, right? This man, Kim Jong-il, spent the last two or three decades of his life starving and immiserating his people. They were too hungry and dependent on the state to ever rise up, and he died in his sleep passing power to his son. Muammar Gaddafi, and you may not know this part, presided over an incredible expansion of programs in health, water, sanitation, nutrition, not just big programs, but effective programs, and even education. And of course, the very people that he provided those services to rose up, overthrew his regime, and murdered him. So I, I'm done, I can just go, right? <laughs> This doesn't quite prove the story. So let me go a little bit deeper into sort of the history of, uh, again, of health and development in a particular generation of, of young Arab people, but also across society, and how that gets us to the Arab Spring. So here's uh, our friend Gaddafi with his other friends, Ben Ali of Tunisia, Saleh of Yemen, and of course, Mubarak of Egypt. They and a generation of fellow despots in the Arab world, beginning in about the 1980s, presided over really, again, an incredible expansion of health and development programs. We can think you know, into some of the reasons for this, right? One of the reasons would be providing basic health services, things like vaccination, are a really good thing to do if you want to prove your legitimacy, make people like you, uh, just establish your right to govern without ever going to the ballot box, right? So this seemed like a pretty good idea in the short term. Also, it turns out that autocrats are pretty good at doing basic health interventions. Think about something like a vaccination program, right? We live in a society, we live in a democratic society where it's considered a good thing to get on television and tell people not to vaccinate their children. 
right? This does not happen. This did not happen in Egypt in the 1980s, right? Vaccination programs require control, organization, compliance, solidarity, perfect for a dictator. Of course, the other thing you need to run these programs is money. Gaddafi had oil money. Ben Ali and Mubarak and Saleh did not, but helpfully, they had the US Agency for International Development willing to help them stay in power. Good work, it's good. But they're getting a return on investment. The progress is fairly incredible, right? You have Egypt starting out in 1970 with a higher infant mortality rate than India and quickly shooting right past it. Libya was scarcely doing any better, right? Arab states were really some of the world's true underachievers in health. Now they would be some of the world's true overachievers in producing good health, quickly closing the gap with the US. This is child health or child mortality. So children were living longer, but of course the natural question is, were they actually healthier? One of the best ways that we can measure health over the long term and your ability to function in a productive society is height. And I don't mean to be heightist here. We all have our own height that we should reach, but in a society with a mix of some people who should be tall, some people who should be short, the change in the average height tracks how many people, what proportion of people never reach their full potential height because they were stunted by disease and hunger. So in the past, in 1950, Sub-Saharan Africa, again, this is based on data from the Demographic and Health Surveys, the average woman in Sub-Saharan Africa was taller than the average woman in the Arab, in the Arab states, but they actually lost height over the last 40 years, whereas women in the Arab states kept getting taller, ta actually becoming taller than women in Sub-Saharan Africa. So better child survival, better height, and carrying into longer and healthier lives. So it's gr these, uh, these benefits, right? One of the things that height, better height picks up is you are less likely to get chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes, whatever else that might kill you in adulthood. So what we get is an incredible reduction in the probability that you will die between, how we measure this in my field, the probability that you will die between your 15th birthday and your 60th birthday. So basically where most of the people in this room are right now. Most of you can take it for granted that you're gonna make it to 60, right? An 8% probability of dying, which may sound surprisingly high. That's the US average for women, for men 12%. For most of the people in this room, it's lower. In countries like Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, that probability of dying was somewhere in the 20% range, 30% range, 30, 40 years ago. And now, if you actually look, a woman in Tunisia, age 15, actually has a better chance of seeing her 60th birthday than a 15-year-old woman, in a 15-year-old female in the United States, which is a pretty incredible achievement. Now, what does that all mean for your life? One of the big things we understand now is that longevity shapes so many po aspects of our lives, right? Longevity shapes, it's easier to think about, right? We're at it, here at a university. The entire concept of a university is predicated on the idea that you have a long adolescence that you can enjoy. You don't have to get to work on subsistence wage earning and having your babies before you die. With basically evolutionary existence. You can go on for a long time, and the fact that you'll keep on going, keep on going means, you know, for the students in my program, you can get that MA in International Studies, that's, and you'll have years and years and years to repay the loans. <laughs> uh, of course, if you died young, I guess you would get out of the loans, but. Um, <laughs> so, this is the story of the Arab Spring generation, right up to about the turn of the century, right? A golden generation filled with opportunity. Again, smaller families, family planning is a big theme today, right? Smaller families, fewer younger siblings, better health, better opportunity, longer lives to look forward to. Basically, they were like the baby boomers in America, right? The way the baby boomers, it wasn't just that they were doing well, it was that everyone around them was doing well. And you had this sense that the future was yours, right? And, and it was pretty amazing. So just one last statistic, right? University enrollment. Egypt, 25%, three times higher than in China. Libya, 49% of university-aged people were enrolled in university, higher than in Germany or Japan. So again, right up to university, the future was bright. 
Everything was great. And this is the bargain, right? You're supposed to get health, you're supposed to get education, and then you're going to get these great jobs and you're going to ride off like South Korea or something. Didn't happen. There are a lot of ways we can measure what happened. Uh, what I how I would describe it is a mass population-wide failure to launch, right? That, and again, not because of anyone's fault. It wasn't that they were slackers. It was that their, their governments let them down, didn't create the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of advanced economic programs, social safety nets that would mitigate the risks of living in a globalized society, the kinds of things that democratically elected governments in places like Mexico, Brazil, Turkey. For those of you who take development class, you hear about all these amazing programs. Dictatorships may be good at the simple things, but they became less good at doing these next things. So we could talk about the lack of good jobs for men or the lack of any jobs for women, but I'd rather go to something that's more important, marriage. In any society that undergoes development, there is bound to be a rise in the age of marriage, especially for women. We want this, right? We don't want women getting married at age 14 or 15. Beyond that, beyond the sort of need to sort of give women a childhood that they can live out, there are also things that keep the age at marriage rising, right? And a lot of you in this room are also dealing with that, right? I want a career, so I'm not going to get married right away. I want to establish myself before I find the right person. I want someone who deserves me, so they need to establish themselves. And this can become a trap, as many people deal with in this country, that age at marriage can rise and rise and rise. So in the US, it's like 26, something like that. Here's Libya. In 1973, the age at first marriage for a Libyan woman was 19, which we would consider too young. It was already up into the 20s by 1984, and it, but it kept going. It never stopped, right? By, the eight, by 2005, the average Libyan male was getting married at 34, the average Libyan female was getting married at 31. Now, just to put this in context, when you are a Libyan woman or a Tunisian woman, this is about the same there, who gets married at age 30, this does not mean I'm going to date, I'm going to look for some people on Facebook, <laughs> I'm going to cohabit, no. right? This is 31 years in your parents' home, yes. celibate. Um, Right, either celibate or on the run. <laughs> this sucks. Right? <laughs> and to make it worse, right, this would suck under any context, but if you were expecting this bright golden future and you had images like this, this is the TV show Noor, beamed from Turkey via satellite on every Arabic television network, right? Noor was this simple country girl who married into a great Istanbul family, and there were all sorts of tra traumas and tragedies, whatever, right? But this was the image being beamed from prosperous, democratic Turkey. Your life is not turning out like this. Also, if you manage to have a family, you're, you want your children to be even better off than you were, and yet improvements in child undernutrition had actually stalled out during the recession. Inequality was on the rise, and as you can guess, things that, there were things that were the government's fault, they got blamed for those. There were things that were not the government's fault, right? The recession was not the government's fault. They were blamed for those as well. The writing was on the walls. It was time for them to go. And of course, the great part of all of this is that they, these despots, like Mubarak, planted the seeds themselves by investing in health and basic development for their population, for people like Mohammed Bouazizi. Just to bring it back to the end, there are still challenges in countries that were part of the Arab Spring, right? There are new governments, there are new norms. This is going to be hard work. But in the democratic Tunisia, this man, Mohammed Bouazizi, who was rejected, thrown out by society, now has, at the very least, in death, his own postage stamp. When I, with, which is a beautiful postage stamp, with the look at, if you at some point get a chance to look at the detail on the fruit cart and everything, I'm already angling to have someone go to Tunisia, like a student. If anyone wants to be an inter, find an internship in Tunisia, pick me up some of these stamps. Um, in watching the, the, the horrible tragedy of how Bouazizi's life ended, but also what came after it, 
I was really reminded of this Arabic proverb that we focus on, that, that we use a lot in some of our programmatic materials. He who has health has hope. He who has hope has everything. Clearly, Mohammed Bouazizi did not feel that way when he took his own life. But in doing that, he brought just an immeasurable amount of hope, not just to people in the Arab world, but to people right here in the US. So just to get back to the question of what is our return on investment for health and development, the reason we should invest in health and development in developing countries is because it's the right thing to do. It's a human right, and people deserve to thrive to their full potential. But for those of us who are looking for a return on investment, look no further than the Arab Spring. Thanks.